For every problem that we face, we know of solutions. The question is, will enough people, young people, find the ability, the commitment, the dedication to implement the kinds of solutions that we know are possible? There's no way to predict. It's a matter of will and choice. It's a matter of action and not speculation. That was Noam Chomsky. I'm Sam Fragoso, and this is Talk Easy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here this week. Uh, Today on the show, we're doing something a little bit different. As the coronavirus crisis carries onward, I wanted to have on two people that I thought could speak to our current situation. The first is Noam Chomsky, a philosopher, author, linguist, professor, and historian. He is also Noam Chomsky and needs no further introduction from me. My talk with him comes later in this episode, and in it he addresses the potential political and sociological ramifications this crisis may have on us. But to start, I called up Dr. Ashish Jha. He's the director over at the Harvard Global Health Institute. Some of you may remember Dr. Jha from an episode we aired just a month ago. Many more of you are probably familiar with Dr. Jha from your television sets, as he's been a recurring face on MSNBC, Fox, CNN, and PBS throughout this pandemic. This week, I ask him about the current climate within the medical industry and the stories he's hearing from the front lines inside the hospitals as resources run scarce. We also discuss a realistic roadmap to recovery to better understand when we may be able to return to something like normal life. Dr. Ja has a kind of even keel temperament about him that I have found very, very comforting in these trying times. I hope you may feel the same. So, why don't we try calling him up? Dr. Ja, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, how are you doing? I'm, I'm good. I'm well. I'm keeping safe, keeping healthy. How about you? Oh, well, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the wrong question to ask, Sam? No, no. I'm, I'm glad you're immediately asking me questions. Um, in your article for Forbes just a couple days ago, yep. you compared our current predicament to a war zone. Yeah. You wrote, we're on a battlefield wearing blindfolds. For people who didn't read that article, tell me where you think we're at. As everybody knows, we are in the biggest, most consequential pandemic uh, of a century. And um, if we do things well, if we're smart, um, we manage the issues effectively, um, we'll probably still lose millions of people across the world. But if we mishandle this, if we don't do the things that we know we need to do, it'll be 10 times that. It'll be completely devastating to our uh, to our, our country, to the world. And a fundamental part of managing this disease is knowing who's infected and who isn't. And that's how we make a game plan. That's how we uh, decide where we're going to put our energy and efforts. It's by focusing on people who are infected, uh, letting people who are not get back to their lives. We can't do any of that without testing people. And, and it's the sort of public health 101 that we have somehow not managed to get right so far. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to policymakers uh, and folks in DC, what has that dialogue been like? People, I think, understand on some basic level that we need to have testing. Um, But I think there have been a couple of stories that have um, settled in that are really uh, problematic. One is people think, well, 
surely we've solved this by now. It is so basic, so 101. Uh, how, how could we not have fixed this? And the president says every day that we fix it, we're testing more than any other country in the world. And, and, and it turns out, you know, we haven't fixed it, right? And the other narrative that has settled in is testing was important early, but it doesn't matter anymore. And that I find even more frustrating because, you know, it mattered early. It mattered now. It will matter in three months. It is the single most important thing, the single most important tool we have. And it just stands to reason. Right? If you want to if you want to figure out how to get humanity through this, you got to know who's infected. You got to know who do you focus on. And, and otherwise, we're going to be shut down the way we are. So I, I, these two narratives keep coming up. I keep battling them. Um, people get it. And then a week later, people seem to have forgotten. Where has that second narrative come from? Some of it, I think, came from a good place in that at, at some point when we really just failed on testing and it became very clear that our country was going to get overwhelmed with infections and that... Um, hospitals were going to get overwhelmed and many, many people were going to die, that a lot of people said, okay, testing is important, but we got to focus on other things too. And we've got to focus on getting doctors and nurses, their equipment. We got to focus on making sure hospitals are well stocked, all completely true. And we got to focus on social distancing, also true. And so in order to say this is more than just testing, which I agree with, it shifted from it's things other than testing. And you can see that subtle shift when you move to a new thing or an add-on a thing, it's easy enough to forget the, the first thing that was so critical. I think that's been part of it. And the other part of it is because it just hasn't moved as, as much as it needs to, I think a lot of people have decided, well, maybe it's not so important and maybe we can focus on something else instead. So let's talk about one facet of testing for a second. A major concern across the medical community is the country's need to test people who are asymptomatic, people who are not sick, people who are healthy. Yep. And these doctors say that until we do this, the data we have is unreliable. Yep. Some doctors say we're reporting dangerous outputs, data that has very little foundation in reality. Can you walk me through this? Yeah. So the way to think about it is if you take 100 people who are infected, and this is based on the best evidence we have as of today. If you take 100 people who are infected, um, what we know is that probably about 15, 20 of them will end up getting really pretty sick, sick enough to need hospital care. And uh, some chunk of those people, maybe four or five out of that 100, end up needing ICU care, and you know, one or two out of that 100 end up actually dying. But what about the other 80 who are not so sick as who need hospital care? Here, the data really is unclear. We, we think, I think, and again, I hope you hear a little hesitation in my voice because we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what we think is out of that 80, maybe 40 or 50 have symptoms. They have fever. They have a cough. They feel, they feel terrible. And, and they want to get tested, but they usually can't because we don't have enough testing capacity. And another 20 or 30 out of that 100 the rest of the folks, barely feel anything at all. They might feel completely well, or they might feel a little off, but nothing serious. And they are going around spreading the infection as much as anybody else is. And so we're not going to get our arms around this disease, and we're not going to bring uh, any kind of control to the infection unless we can identify who those folks are and get them to not go out to restaurants and not go out to bars and stay at home. Mm -hmm. And it's fine when we're all shut down. That is okay. It's, not, it's still not great. You still want to identify them. But the moment you open up, those asymptomatic people are going to be the neighbor in your office, the person in the cubicle next to you, the person sharing your lunch with you. Um, and that's going to be a real problem um, so we want to identify people who are sick. Uh, we still can't test them. We want to test them. But we want to test a whole bunch of other folks who are asymptomatic because we've got to know who's infected and who's not. And if you're infected, you can't be going out to restaurants and bars, not until you're better. Well, you know, on the subject of endangering yourself and potentially others, there was this report given by a nurse in New Orleans I don't know if you saw it, but she said the following to the New York Times. 
as healthcare workers, we're all the biggest carriers. We're infecting people. The people that are taking care of you are just as infected. When it comes to doctors and nurses themselves, she said there's a strong culture of not testing. There's a fear that tests may run out and a concern of steep hospital bills. When pressed by the New York Times on why these healthcare workers wouldn't just get tested or stay home, she said, I don't know. We needed people, and we needed people to be working, even if you're afraid that you might be sick. It's a culture where one doctor says to another, Oh, are you sick? But are you that sick? I mean, we all got it, right? And we've heard these accounts from across the country. That was from one nurse in New Orleans, but uh, I've been in contact with a doctor in Baltimore, a doctor in Chicago. All of these healthcare workers are on the front lines, and almost all of them have resigned themselves to the fact that they will get this disease. It's not a matter of if, but when for these people, and they're just hoping they won't need the ICU. I'm curious, have you been hearing similar reports, and if so, how could this possibly be sustainable? I have, and it is, again, it's it's born out of a very uh, important ethos in medicine, but it's hugely problematic right now. And, and, um, And the ethos is one of, you know, the patient comes first. So you wake up in the morning and you're having a bad day. You put it aside and you go to work and you take care of people uh, because the patient is there and they need you. And and not only does a patient come first, but your brothers and sisters, your fellow doctors and fellow nurses, um, they they come second, right, after the patient. So if you are not there, they're going to have to take care of more people and you're going to increase the burden on them. And so you have to do your part. We see sentiments like this in the military. We see this in in other situations where people are facing what feels like a common enemy, which it is in this case, coronavirus, and challenging situations is that you don't want to be the person who calls in sick and says, I know that means that you're going to have to take care of a lot more patients today, but I'm I'm going to stay at home. I, I get where that culture comes from. I have participated in that culture. And in retrospect, I have thought about times when I clearly should not have gone into work, but I did, and, and didn't even think twice about it. Um, but in this context, that culture born out of um, a really great place and, and, and good motivations is harming, harming all of us, is harming doctors and nurses, but it's also harming patients, because then we can end up being the conduit for more infections. So it's, it's very hard, and it's very hard to change culture in the middle of, a, of an outbreak, you know. Uh, but this is a place where great healthcare leadership becomes important. And, and I think senior clinical leaders need to make uh, this point very plainly, um, that you're not doing anybody a favor. You're not helping your patients. You're not helping your fellow uh, providers, doctors, and nurses when you do this. And for them, if not for yourself, but for them, you have to stay home, you have to take care of yourself, and you have to protect yourself um, because there will be nobody left to take care of sick patients if everybody gets, if all the doctors and nurses get sick. But what's the alternative look like? I mean, they stay home, but there is a finite number of healthcare workers, right? Yes. No, and this is where, um, you know, this is where early action would have been so helpful is that if we could have prevented the number of people who got very, very sick, it would have been less of a strain. And of course, this is why people need to continue to stay at home right now until we are at a point where, you know, the health system is not so strained. Um, but, but we've been doing a lot to try to expand um, the, the pool, right? We've, we've had retired doctors and nurses coming back. We've had doctors and nurses from around the country flying into New York with the expectation, assumption, and I I don't think they expect it, but I expect it, that when their hometowns get hit, that a lot of doctors from New York will pick up and go there. Um, That kind of camaraderie is wonderful, and it's it's great. And that will help, but it may not be enough. But nonetheless, uh, what I've been saying to my friends and colleagues is, if you're feeling sick, you got to stay home. You got to take care of yourself. 
Because at the end of the day, uh, you sick in the hospital is worse than you not at the hospital at all. Of the healthcare workers that you've spoken to over the past few weeks, what has their general temperament been like? There is this incredible sense of, of focus and mission right now. Um, I, I think some amount of frustration that, um, that our country has uh, not supplied them with basic protective equipment, that our government has uh, chosen uh, not to prioritize their safety. But remarkable in that, uh, that no one I have spoken to uh, suggests that that somehow then um, makes their obligations to their patients sort of null and void, that it abrogates, you know, kind of their personal um, obligation. And, and this is interesting because one of the things that I've been thinking about is, of course, doctors and nurses have an ethical responsibility to take care of patients. But society has an ethical responsibility to make sure that doctors and nurses are protected. And if society through its government says, we're not doing that, we're just not going to do it, it's not a priority, mm -hmm. then does the initial ethical obligation of doctors and nurses to patients still remain? And the answer I've heard from my colleagues is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. We're not backing off, even if society is not, doesn't have our back. I think it's heroic. It also, in some ways, breaks my heart because it means a lot of people are getting sick and a lot of people are dying. Um, and that's just frustrating. But the sense of mission is very clear. What's the most horrifying story you've heard behind closed doors? In terms of the kinds of things the doctors and nurses are having to go through? Yes. Um, you know, and some of this has made it out into the media, but, you know, having to, having to wear garbage bags uh, because there's no gowns that uh, can protect you. Uh, having, you know, the, the stories that I've heard of, about uh, the face mask that you have to use day in, day out, and after a while it starts smelling. And, but you can't toss it uh, because there is not another one. And uh, there's no easy way to clean it without uh, ruining its protective uh, capability. And so you continue to wear it. Um, you know, these are small stories, um, but I think over time they accumulate and they grate on people. Um, but people continue. Again, I haven't heard anybody say, that's it, I give up, I'm walking away. Uh, they feel like their obligation is to the patient in front of them. And so even with that stinky face mask or the garbage bag as a, as a gown, uh, they're going to do what they need to do. There's also this economic consideration that I don't want to leave out. You know, I, I have from a friend here that hospitals are notorious for mistreating and exploiting providers, pandemic or not. Uh, she said, hospital administrators who know nothing about clinical care could care less about patients or providers. They only care about the bottom line. And this is uh, coming from a few folks who work on the front lines, that the more renowned the hospital, the worse it is. They think low pay and being overworked and appreciated is acceptable for the privilege of working for one of these big hospitals. And that behavior that sort of mentality is still embedded in the system, even in this crisis. Have you heard about this? Yeah, I think my experience, and I, well, I've certainly heard of, the, of this idea, right? And there's definitely examples of uh, hospital executives who care fundamentally about the bottom line and only about the bottom line. And actually, one of the things I've written and talked a lot about is what are the obligations of hospitals that are nonprofit? Because nonprofit is another way of saying you don't have to pay taxes. We're giving you a break. We as society, and but you owe something for that nonprofit. And a lot of hospitals have forgotten that they have a mission. Um, that society has given them a big financial break for, and 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 this is a huge uh, general challenge. You know, in this outbreak, I've seen a mix. So. There are hospitals that have continued that same path. I, I spoke to a, a very senior hospital executive about 10 days ago, and um, we were talking about hospital capacity. And he said, I don't plan to cancel any elective surgeries. They are my most lucrative procedures. And I said, so what are you going to do with COVID patients? And he said, I'll find a way to make sure they go elsewhere. I said, okay. I guess you can try. And this was your friend? 
a colleague, let's just say that <laughs> <laughs> someone I've known for 20 years. Right. By the way, of our two conversations, this is the first time you've backpedaled and been like, no, 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 he's a, he's not my friend. I swear, I just, I just, he happens to have been in my life for two decades. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, look, it's hard to know how to be friends with someone like that. You can, you can appreciate them. He's a smart guy. He, he is very effective at his job. But there is a disconnect on values that really does make it hard for me to feel like <laughs> we're friends. You know, I, I'd have a cup of coffee with them, but I don't know that I'd... Anyway, it doesn't matter. But, but he represents a, a, you know, a, a slice, a, a, a chunk of hospitals, a chunk of organizations that I think are doing that. But I also have colleagues and now people I'd call friends who, you know, senior hospital leaders who said, for the next three months, I'm not going to take a salary or I'm going to cut my salary in half. And I'm just going to take those dollars and donate it to frontline providers so they get a little extra. Um, and they are there at 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday, um, not on the front lines bothering the doctors and nurses, but one step behind, you know, working the phones, trying to make sure that the equipment is showing up, trying to make sure that. So it's a pretty heterogeneous set of responses. Um, but I, I think it'd be unfair to not call out those people who have done the heroic work of they're not on the, they're not taking care of the patients, but they're taking care of the people who are taking care of the patients. And I've seen that too. And it's been heartening. And it's been at some very, very big uh, academic, famous academic medical centers that we've seen some excellent behavior as well. So, so it's a bit of both. Before we get into what the next two or three months may look like, yeah. I'm curious, what is a piece of this evolving story that you think is not getting enough coverage in the mainstream media? What are we missing? What are we not talking about enough? There are a couple of things that... Um, I've been thinking a lot about that I feel like maybe I'm not hearing so much about. It is remarkable to me how well the American people, not everybody, but most Americans, how well they have adapted to, or let's say how well they've been compliant. I hate that word, but with this idea of social distancing. I mean, it's really working. People really are staying home. Uh, people really are staying away from each other. And that's such an odd thing to ask people to do, right? Like all of a sudden, your governor said, hey, don't go out, don't spend time with friends and family, don't. And people more or less have done it. And I think it's amazing. I, I have to tell you, I've been, I just assumed there'd be a lot more pushback, a lot of people saying, uh-uh, I'm going to go on with my life. And there's been a little, but very little. So I think that's been remarkable, and I think it has not gotten enough attention, and it has been hugely helpful. The other part of it, though, Sam, and the part that I worry about is what is happening at home for folks. Um, we've seen little bits of data about increases in domestic violence. We've seen little bits of data about increases in loneliness and mental illness. But while people, while I just spend all this time celebrating that people have been compliant with this and have done it. I, I think we have paid very little attention to what the impact on people's lives has been. And we're not done, right? We're right now still in, in the first half of April, and um, this is not ending in April, and I don't think it's largely ending in May. And I worry a lot about what people's lives will be like, how much suffering there is that we're just, we're going to uncover over time and realize how expensive social distancing really was. Yeah, I mean, how tenable do you think it is for people to socially distance and, and self-isolate for the rest of April and uh, through most of May? Do you, do you see that happening? This is going to get harder and harder, right? And, and I think... Um, we've got to get through April and we've got to try to get through as much of May as possible. Uh, and part of this is, you know, I'm talking to my public health friends, the kind of experts that I spend time talking to, and they're saying things like, oh, Ashish, you're being too optimistic. We need to have everything shut down through July. 
And then maybe we can open up for a month and maybe six weeks and we'll have to shut down again. And they're showing me data and models. I look at and the data and models are pretty good. And I get why people say that. And I get why they think that's what we need to do. And they're not technically wrong. But my take is that is untenable. I can't imagine saying to Americans, basically through July, um, I just don't think it'll work. I don't think people will do it. I don't think people can. And so on one hand, I'm fighting that battle of trying to convince my public health friends that we got to open up much sooner. And then, of course, on the other hand, I'm hearing from everybody else that I just can't keep going. So you know, this really gets us to where we need to go in the future. I think we've got to hold on as long as we can. And I hope and pray that we can hold on through a good chunk of May. And then we've got to open up slowly and we've got to open up deliberately and we've got to open up in a data-driven way. And this is why I keep emphasizing testing because testing gives us data. And at that point, we've got to let people get as much of their lives back as we can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that the moment we let up, the virus will start circulating more robustly, more vigorously. And the longer we are open, the more the virus will spread in our communities. So there's no question that, that um, it will increase. And this is why a lot of people think, well, we'll just have to shut down again. I think that a very vigorous testing, tracing, isolation strategy can allow us to stay open. We won't go back to life as usual, but I think so many of the things that we're all missing and craving in our lives, just basic social interactions outside of the maybe two or three people we live with, um, we, I think we'll start being able to get that back. But we're really caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, there is no um, easy path out of this. So that's why I've been pushing for, please stay at home, but as soon as we can, um, let's start relaxing at least some of these restrictions so people can start getting back to work and maybe kids can start going back to school. Right. I think everyone is eager to get back to work, to go back to school. Well, maybe not go back to school, but they want to feel something that is vaguely normal. Yeah. So let's talk about a reasonable roadmap for this country. A lot of the timetables predicting when we can reopen America are based on how South Korea dealt with the situation, how they managed to keep offices and restaurants open during the crisis. Yeah. Walk me through how they managed this. South Korea and, and Singapore um, and a couple other places um, did a few different things that I think are worth understanding. And then maybe I can shift to how that might play out here. Um, but, but fundamentally, what those places did um, was they they had a very robust tracing tracking program. So that meant, what I mean by that is, if you got infected, uh, if you were found to be infected, um, you got quarantined, but they would track down everybody you had spent time with and quarantine all those people as well. Um, a lot of the bigger venues came got closed. They did a reasonable job of keeping restaurants and, and other social gathering places open, but with a lot more social distancing built into them. And that I have been arguing is our path forward. So when I look for ahead, let's say we can get through most of May and we have really good testing data. So we know where it's safe to open. When we open, um, offices can start letting people come back to work. But if it's a super crowded office, maybe it's only half the people come back on, on Mondays and Wednesdays and the other half people come back on Tuesdays and Thursdays or some sort of a you know, halfway opening. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine restaurants and bars opening, but I can also imagine a rule that says they can only, meet, they can only fill up to 50% of fire code capacity, which will necessarily mean that you know, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be a lot more space. There'll be fewer crowds. There will not be a packed bar on a Saturday night that you will go to. Um, I don't see any possibilities of a baseball game where 30,000 fans are packed into a stadium because you do one of those and a few of the folks there are infected and a couple of them are super spreaders and you will fuel an outbreak that will shut the whole city down for four weeks. 
and cities will decide that a single baseball game isn't worth shutting the whole place down for four weeks. So those are the kinds of changes that I think are going to be necessary and coupled with, and here's where it starts getting tricky. So coupled with this very vigorous tracing program that, you know, as I said, South Korea and Singapore did, where you're going to, we're going to have to decide how much civil liberties we're willing to give up. So we may have an app on our phone, and, and this may very well come to be, that is put, out, put in there by your carrier. And when you test positive, it will send an alert to everybody you've been within six feet of in the last five days. And it won't say, hey, Ashish is positive. But it'll say someone you were in close contact with was positive in the last, you know, someone you made contact with in the last five days. And then all those people need to go get tested. And anybody who's positive then needs to get quarantined. And that cycle begins again for them. And this is the kind of vigorous program we're going to need to have if we're going to have a shot at staying open. Now, people are going to be like, I'm not super comfortable with that. And I understand. And my response is, how comfortable are you shutting down for several months again? Mm. Because those are going to be our choices. And the choice of life goes back to normal. I can do what I want. That's going to be not with us until this pandemic comes to an end. And under the best of circumstances, the pandemic comes to an end in 12 to 18 months from now. You know, I listen to the president. He says, we want to open up. It will be great. Life will be back to normal. And we want to open up May 1st. And I play out that scenario in my head. And I say, okay, let's do what the president is suggesting. What happens? What happens is that we open up May 1st. The first couple of weeks will be great. And everybody will feel like, oh, thank God we're over this thing. And by late May, the rates of infections will start getting very, very high across all of America. And by early June, the hospitals will be filled up again, and people will be dying at alarmingly high numbers, and we will shut down. And when we shut down, we'll have to be shut down for three months. And so we'll be shut down through the summer into early fall. And there are public health people who think this is going to be our cycle. We're going to open, shut, open, shut. And we're going to potentially spend 50 to 70% of our time shut. I, I lay that out for folks and I say, that's the most likely scenario. Um, and the question is, what are you willing to do for an alternative scenario? How much are you willing to sacrifice? And I find that most people find the scenario I've laid out of open, shut, open, shut to be intolerable. Uh, the idea that we'd open for four or six weeks and then shut for three months just feels intolerable. And I think it is intolerable. I think the economic effects, I think the social impacts of that will just be awful. Um, and so then the alternative is, okay, I'm willing to make some sacrifices. If I'm infected, I'm willing to go be quarantined for two weeks. Um, because I don't have another, like there's no third alternative that says you just get to have your life back and everything will be fine. Um, not that I know of. And so trying to help people understand that, that our choices are limited, um, but if we, if we all collectively agree on that kind of middle path of testing, isolation, quarantine, tracing, um, we can get enough of our lives back that, you know, Sam, you and I have never met each other, but we could, we could get together for a drink and, and talk and, and <laughs> that would be lovely. But we can only do that if we're willing to go through that. Uh, through that middle path. I can't wait to get a drink with you in 2023. It's going to be so wonderful. Um, <laughs> 2020, Sam. We're going to do it this year. Oh, my God. That would be great. Um, you keep going back to this idea of sacrifice, but do you think our country is willing to forfeit civil liberties in the name of public safety? And let's think about what that would look like. You know, that would include rigorous monitoring of our cell phones, checkpoints where our temperatures would constantly be taken, rules and regulations for not just everyone with the virus, but anyone you may have exposed to it. Yeah. And I mention all this because there are large swaths of this country that really believe in their hearts that one of the key principles of the Democratic Party is that everyone just wants to take their guns. If that sounds silly, it's because it definitely is. But I have to mention it because there are a lot of people across this country that will tell you 
They want less government in their life, not more of it, even when it comes to public safety. Yeah. Can I, let me, let me tell you how I think this plays out. Okay. Um, this is where federalism, you know, the fact that we states are, have a certain amount of sovereignty has been a real challenge in our country in many times in our history, but it's also been a real boon. And in this pandemic, it's been both. When our federal government refused to act on social distancing, a bunch of states did. The governor of Ohio shut down Ohio much earlier than the federal government suggested they should. Uh, so did parts of California. So did uh, other places, Washington State. Um, but it, it's been a real challenge in that when we're trying to get ventilators, all of a sudden we have 50 states all competing for ventilators and competition is not helpful in this. So there are times when federalism is helpful, other times when it's really harmful. I think on this issue, it's going to be helpful, even though I wish we could have a single national program. One could imagine that Massachusetts has already committed to a pretty aggressive testing tracing program. The governor, our, our governor, who's a Republican, um, just last week said, we're going to do this. And what will happen is states will open. And Massachusetts will be able to stay open because of this. And states that say, we're not doing that, we're just not going to do it, they're going to see their numbers rise. And we're, they're going to start seeing people get sick and people dying. And at some point, people in those states are going to say, you know, nobody's going to a restaurant or nobody's going out to the bars because the hospitals are full and, and people are dying and it's awful. And People in those states are going to clamor for an alternative. That is not how I want to make policy. That's not what I want. But I fear that that's what's going to drive some states to say, okay, give us another option. And they're going to see states like Massachusetts and Ohio and, uh, and, uh, and I think California and other places relatively open, not perfect, but relatively open. And they'll say, we want that. And they'll understand that the cost of that is somebody, maybe it's not their government, probably not the federal government, but somebody will be able to track down everybody that they have spent time with. And they'll have to give up that information. I don't know how else you do it, except making the cost and the benefits of this which you know is a real violation of civil liberties. I don't love the idea that like if I got sick, uh, somebody would figure out everybody I have been in contact with in the last five days. I don't love that. But I'm willing to, to give that up if it means that I get, to, you know, I get to go to the office, I get to see my friends, I get to go out for a drink with a friend every once in a while. Um, I think when people see that that's the trade-off, they will make it. Um, but I worry that until people have seen the benefits of this effort and this approach, uh, they won't. You know, so much of the discourse around COVID-19 is about readiness, how we can best prepare ourselves for when this virus returns. Yeah. The return either this fall or early next year seems like almost a given at this point. Yeah. And yet, do you see any way in which this virus could be eradicated? To, to have this specific virus eradicated? Yes. This virus is now in our community in every community around the world. And only two things will bring this pandemic to an end, only one of two things. Um, the first is we get a highly effective vaccine. Um, and we are 12 to 18 months away from that. Or second, that we have so many people around the world infected that we essentially achieve what people call, and I hate this term, but I use it because I don't have a better one, um, what people call herd immunity. The idea that so many people have been infected and have become immune that the virus no longer finds susceptible hosts. 60-70% um, of the world's population will have to be infected for that to occur. Maybe as low as 40%, but still a very large number. And there is no third thing that I know of, because even if we did everything else right, with massive social distancing, we can get the infection rates very, very, very low, but we can't get it to zero. Somebody will have it, somebody will spread it, and the as long as one person is infected in America, 
it, the virus will continue spreading uh, until, again, we hit that number of large numbers of people having been previously infected. So, you know, this pandemic comes to an end when we have a vaccine. That's really the story. Um, and until then, the virus can be a small part of our lives. It can be a major part of our lives. Um, it, it won't go away. I shouldn't call it a small part of our lives. It'll be an important part of our lives no matter what. But it can either completely paralyze us or it can let us have some semblance of our lives back. Um, but that will be difficult to pull off and we'll have to give up some things in order to get that. Last thing before we go. Uh, we've talked about everything and everyone but you. Uh, so before you go on to any number of cable network shows that I've seen you on, by the way, I think you've become like the Jude Law of MDs. Everywhere I look, I see your face on the television. I was like, wow, he got that role and he got that role. I think all these people need to be paying you a lot of money uh, since they still have it and are profiting greatly from this crisis, which is something I don't even want to get into. Um, but really, uh, how are you and your family faring right now? How are you keeping it together? Well, thank you for asking. I, I you know, I, um, have not in this outbreak been on the front lines with my, um, fellow physicians and, and nurses and others. Um, and I feel like, but I'm still part of this mission. I, I have a job and my job is to try to take the incredible amount of science that's being generated, um, take all the uncertainty and all the data and try to communicate it to people in a way that's honest and fair and not sugarcoated, um, but also comprehensible. And to the extent that I feel like I'm doing that, I'm going to keep going. And the personal toll or whatever is pretty trivial. I mean, I think about people who are out of jobs, people who are, you know, in really bad situations at home and can't get away. I, you know, we've got the standard challenges. The kids are going crazy. Um, <laughs> everybody's patience is being tested. Uh, uh, you know, it, the life is, life is hard, but for me, like life is, hard compared to what it normally is, but I think it's really easy compared to what most Americans are going through. So I feel mostly blessed and I feel like I have a job in front of me and I got to get to it and I got to do it. And through the public stuff, but also a lot of stuff I do on the background, I'm calling people and I'm trying to get folks to move on issues that I think are important, talking to policymakers, just trying to feel like a five years from now I can look back and feel like I did something useful in the middle of the biggest pandemic that humanity faced. Um, that's the goal. And to do it for myself, for my wife, for my kids, for you, for all of us. Um, because we really are in this together, right? Like if you keep doing what you're doing and I keep doing what I'm doing and we're all working, pulling in the same direction, Sam, uh, we are going to get through this. So that's been my motivation. Well, I appreciate your cautious optimism here. And truly, thank you for all the hard work. I know these past six weeks have been a lot for you uh, and your family and many of your colleagues on the front lines. So truly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm not terribly optimistic we're going to get that drink this year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I certainly hope we do. I, will, I do too. Dr. Ja. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me back on. That was Dr. Ashish Jha. He's the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. To learn more about Dr. Jha, you can visit our site at www.talkeasypod.com. Before we get into Gnome, I wanted to take this time to thank a few people who recently made donations to the program. Sherelle Jellin, Ulrich Hammer, Linda Butler, and Sunrise Ayers. And yes, in case you were wondering, none of those people are made up. They all just have incredible names. If you'd like to make a contribution, be sure to visit our site at www.talkeasypod.com slash donate. I know these are difficult times for everyone right now, especially financially. 
so we really appreciate any support you can offer us. That said, if you can't make a financial contribution, I still believe the most helpful thing you can do for us is to share this show online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, with a friend, a family member, anyone. God knows we all have way too much time on our hands than ever before. Maybe they like our episodes with Gloria Steinem, Better O'Rourke, Laura Dern, Werner Herzog, Errol Morris, Juliette Lewis, Edward Norton, Malcolm Gladwell, Naomi Klein, Alan Alda, Rob Reiner. I'm going to stop. I'm sorry. It's a lot of people. You get the point. It's 160 plus episodes. And I cannot tell you how appreciative everyone on the Talk Easy team is when we see someone sharing this podcast online. We're an independently operated show, and it truly means the world to us when we see people care about the hard work that we put into this thing week after week. With that said, let's get into the next conversation. Uh, Noam and I first spoke back in 2016, two weeks after President Trump was elected. In that interview, which you can find in our show notes, he offered some grim prognostications that have, unfortunately, come to pass since then. I'll admit, this conversation is a little shorter than our normal episodes. I'd like to say that was planned, but we had some technical difficulties. It turns out sending a microphone to someone in another state is not so easy right now. Nevertheless, it was an honor to sit with Noam once again. We'll be having him back on this summer for those who want to hear more from him. I know I do. So, without further ado, here is Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, thank you so much for being here with me. How are you doing? Uh, doing fine. Are you uh, fatigued by the technical challenges? Oh, yeah. I have to go back to MIT and get a PhD in computer science. <laughs> um, I wanted to start, uh, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, you were called on by innumerable publications and TV networks to speak on the attack to provide an academic and historic context to what was happening. We're now in this similar, if more grave, moment with the coronavirus. Have you tried to make sense of where we're at in this country? Uh, the United States is way behind other countries in dealing with it. Uh, the countries in the perimeter of China have done quite well. Uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. And New Zealand apparently has almost completely conquered the virus. It seems to be stopped, essentially. In uh, Europe, they sort of dithered for a long time, but some of the better organized societies have it under control. Uh, Germany has, I think, the lowest death rate in the world. Uh, Norway's also doing pretty well. The others are coming to terms with it. Uh, the, the Britain kind of bungled it at first, but seems to be going. The United States is a total disaster. It's the uh, epicenter of the crisis. It's the only country, the only major country, where it can't even provide data to the World Health Organization because it's so out of control. Uh, the Trump administration, the way they handled it is almost indescribable. Uh, they knew by January from Chinese information uh, just what was happening, uh, but uh, couldn't get to the White House. U.S. intelligence was trying to reach the White House. As we just learned today, one of the top advisors, Peter Navarro, in late January, was reporting the Chinese information to the White House. Nobody could get through. Uh, Trump was either playing golf or watching his uh, ratings on Fox TV or something. If, so it was one day it's just flu, another day it's serious, another day go back to work, another day forget it, it's terrible, and I was the first person ever to notice it. Uh, in any event, the situation is disastrous. Uh, 
we can ask several questions. One question is why is the US so behind? A deeper question is why did this happen altogether? I mean, as to why the US is so behind, we can look at the wrecking ball in the White House. Uh, in fact, it's almost incredible. Ever since Trump got into office, he's been cutting back every year, cutting back the health-related elements of the government, Center for Disease Control and so on, just cutting them. Uh, this year, he produced a budget on February 10th when the ec epidemic was raging all over the country. Uh, the budget called for red further reductions in Center for Disease Control and every other health related element of the government. In fact, reductions in just about everything that relates to human welfare. Uh, and an increase in funding, an increase in subsidies for the fossil fuel industries. It's almost madness. You can't describe it. Well, that's the United States. It's, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, Trump is busy turning it into what he called a shithole country. But that's the United States. Now, what about the deeper question of why this happened altogether? Here we get to real issues, which have to be dealt with if we don't want the another pandemic to recur, which is very likely. Predictions are they will keep recurring. Each will be worse than the last. Uh, the last major one, there were others, was the SARS flu, SARS coronavirus, 2003. At that point, scientists knew with high confidence that this is going to recur. And take a look at what happened. Uh, the virus was identified, the genome was sequenced, uh, people started working, drug, uh, started working on vaccines. The vaccines were developed, but they were never pushed through the testing phase. Uh, then, in a sane society, the entities that are concerned with health would have started working to prepare for the next pandemic so they'd be ready for it and I could abort it before it starts. Well, who are they? First of all, they're drug companies. Drug companies follow capitalist logic. Uh, they look at market signals and the market signals say there's no profit in trying to fend off a major catastrophe. Uh, the profit lies in doing things that'll sell today. Okay, so that's what they did. Well, so far, that's just ordinary capitalist logic, a suicidal, but ordinary. Then comes another hammer blow, the neoliberal version of savage capitalism, which begins with Reagan, really. You may recall that one of Reagan's first pronouncements was government is the problem, not the solution. So in, again, in a sane world, when the drug companies fail because they observe capitalist logic, the government would move in. Uh, just the way the government basically produced the Salk vaccine, which was offered free and which ended the plague of polio. But that was then when we were still under the basically New Deal system of regimented capitalism. Now we're in the regime since Reagan of un unrestricted capitalism, let it go wild. So the government couldn't intervene to deal with the market collapse. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how it happened in detail. Uh, so uh, President Obama, his administration recognized that there is a problem. Uh, and it turns out if you take a look at the hospitals today, the real bottleneck, the thing that's causing the major crises, is the lack of ventilators. Well, that was forecast. So uh, Obama did contract with a small company that was producing high quality, low cost ventilators. Well, it was bought up by a larger company, uh, Covidian, and they shelved the project. Uh, presumably because it was competing with their expensive ventilators. They didn't want to cut that back. A little later, they 
turned to the government and they said they wanted to cancel the contract because uh, the project of low cost, high quality ventilators wasn't profitable enough. Okay, that's capitalist logic again. It was well known that a crisis was on the way. All through Trump's term, it was well known and he kept every year cutting back defunding the health related institutions and cutting back the uh, surveillance of them and so on. Uh, but it was still well known as late as October, there was a high level simulation of a pandemic crisis showing how, uh, how severe it was. Uh, in uh, December, on December 31st, China reported to the World Health Organization that they were finding pneumonia-like symptoms of uh, unknown etiology. A week later, Chinese scientists figured out what it was. They informed the World Health Organization that it was another coronavirus. Uh, they identified the genome, sequenced it, and provided the information to the world. Uh, at that point, it was public knowledge. Uh, US intelligence knew all about it. Uh, for months, they tried to reach the White House to tell, try to break through to explain that this is a severe crisis. Uh, other countries, as I mentioned, uh, did respond. The East Asian countries are, have it under control. Uh, New Zealand has apparently killed it. If we want to prevent a recurrence of this, we've got, got to go back to the root, not the idiosyncrasies of the United States, but the root of it, which is in market failures that are bound to recur and the neoliberal hammer blow that says the government can't intervene. And I should make it clear that that mantra of that government is the problem, now that only holds when the fate of the population is at stake. If uh, corporate uh, corporations are in trouble, then government is the solution. That's the world we're living in. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to recur worse. And remember that right in the background is a growing crisis that puts all of this into the shadow. We will recover from the coronavirus at great cost in the United States at much greater cost than is necessary because of the I don't know what to call it, the farce in the White House, mm -hmm. but we will recover. Uh, there's something else from which we won't recover. And while we're all talking about this, uh, the Arctic uh, ice sheets are melting, uh, leading to a feedback effect. As the ice sheets melt, first of all, they uh, raise the sea level, but beyond that, they reduce the reflective capacity of ice and are replaced by dark water, which means that instead of reflecting the sun's rays, we now absorb them. So the feedback loop goes into operation and it accelerates global warming, which is an existential crisis and one that Trump is dedicated to accelerate. Uh, we know the details uh, and this is indescribable. There has never been a crime like this in human history. Literally, the US is leading the way to trying to destroy the prospects for organized life on Earth. And it's not that they don't know it. The, high, it, the corporate world knows it, the administration knows it, they all understand it perfectly well. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just to illustrate that, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a memo was leaked from J.P. Morgan Chase, the country's biggest bank. The memo warned that, that their words were, the survival of humanity is at risk if we continue in our present course, including the bank's loans to uh, fossil fuel industries. So it's all understood, nothing less than the survival of humanity, but Capitalist logic says race ahead. Right. And the in insanity says let's accelerate it. And amazingly, in my view, can't 
just can't understand it. His loyal, adoring base, the Republican Party voting base, they love it. The more he destroys things, the more he destroys the country, the more he harms them, the greater the applause. Now, maybe somebody can explain that. You know, th- this capitalist system you're describing, I think uh, the virus has exposed these glaring issues we have with economic inequality in this country. And this is not a new issue, right? You know, in writing the Constitution, James Madison's chief concern was to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. He knew that if the poor could vote freely, that they would get together and take the property of the rich. The Constitution, in many ways, was set up to prevent democracy. But the issue totally predates this country. If we go back to Aristotle, and I know you've talked about this, he believed in a welfare state that Athens could then reduce inequality. So I'm curious, where do you see America heading on this issue once we're on the other side of the crisis? Well, that's up to us. It's up to people like you. Uh, with the there is, there is planning going on right now about the post-crisis world. Uh, the corporate sector is working hard to try to ensure that the post-crisis world will still be in their hands, that they'll be the masters. And if they're not countered and overwhelmed by popular forces, they'll win and we'll move on to suicidal policies and face the consequences. And maybe some people survive living in uh, high mountains and isolated valleys, but uh, we're leading to a crisis of a kind that is almost unimaginable. I mean, bear in mind that we're now approaching the uh, global temperatures of uh, over 100,000 years ago, when the sea level was about 25 feet higher than it is today. We're moving toward that crisis rapidly. There have been other severe uh, crises in geolo- we're now t- not talking about human history, geological history. Uh, we're getting near that. Uh, 65 million years ago, uh, an astero- asteroid hit the Earth. It caused a huge environmental crisis. It wiped out, I think, about 75% of species, ended the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, gradually, life recovered, finally led to us. That's what we are now doing to the earth. We're killing species at a massive rate already. Uh, We're soon going to doom uh, human society and millions of other species. And we know what's wrong. It's not hard to find out. The things I've identified are right on the surface. Uh, They're not quantum physics. You just have to Think for a minute, they're right in front of your eyes. The refusal of the drug companies to prepare, following good capitalist logic, doing exactly what they're supposed to do. The inability of the government to intervene, as it did, for example, with polio. That's a gift of Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman, uh, the other uh, apostles of neoliberalism, and those who followed them including Clinton and others, uh, Obama as well. Okay, that's where we are. It can all be changed. You know, you have been batting around some of these ideas before the coronavirus took hold. On a personal level, I'm curious, Noam, do you feel less hope now than ever? Uh, Not really. I'm... I'm old enough to uh, remember the rise of fascism in Europe. I'm old enough to remember listening to Hitler's addresses over the radio to Nuremberg rallies and the massive applause and adoration. I have to say it, I'm kind of reminded of that when I listen to some of Trump's rallies, so it's quite a different situation. Uh, At that time, it looked as though fascism, the spread of fascism was uh, 
just inexorable, couldn't be stopped, was going to be spread over all of Europe, maybe all of Eurasia, and who knows how far it would go beyond. I mean, that was a hideous threat. Now, that's childhood memories, but it turns out it wasn't unrealistic. Now, the US government was making pretty similar assessments. Uh, in, the, in 1939, uh, high level uh, commissions were established from the State Department and the Council on Foreign Relations, the main non-governmental foreign relations institution closely integrated with the government. They started studies on what the post-war world would look like. And their assumption was there would be two superpowers. The United States would control the Western Hemisphere, would take over the former British Empire, would control the Far East, and uh, Nazi Germany would control the rest. All of Europe, almost all of Eurasia, uh, England, all of Europe. England. That was a horrifying prospect. And it wasn't in the analysis of government analysts. It wasn't really changed until the Russians began to de defeat Nazi Germany. Now, Russia was almost totally responsible for the defeat of Nazi Germany uh, after Stalingrad and the uh, huge uh, tank battle at Kursk where the Russians defeated the cream of the Nazi army and then started moving into Germany, it became pretty clear that Nazi Germany wasn't going to survive the war. And the US planning shifted to a broader uh, attempt to incorporate uh, uh, large parts of Eurasia and of Asia in the US dominated system. So there was a time when it really looked as if uh, the ultimate evil was going to triumph. Mm -hmm. Depression was pretty serious, very serious, in fact. Uh, but uh, today we have a different kind of crisis. It's a natural crisis. The world is telling us you can't go on like this. If you go on like this, you're doomed. Coronavirus will be horrible, but it'll recede. Uh, Spanish flu was worse, recovered, uh, others farther back, uh, but you're not going to recover from the, the melting of the Arctic ice sheets and the other extremely dangerous uh, developments that are taking place as mm -hmm. global warming goes out of control. Uh, you know, I think this is a period where many people in America and across the world are taking stock of their lives and asking where they find value and purpose. Um, you once said, I believe we go from dust to dust and there's no meaning in our lives. There's meaning that we provide to life. There's no meaning outside of our own enrichment of our own life, which we can. So I'm curious, with that, have you searched for meaning? Sure. Every minute of the day, uh, my children, my wife, I play with my dogs who fortunately are keeping quiet instead of barking, hmm. do my work, uh, have friends, all of that puts meaning in life. Your, your father, you know, who you really learned a lot from, I mean, you guys would have these Friday Hebrew readings every Friday night as a kid. He was a principal and professor, and, and he wanted to educate people so that they would be, and I quote, well integrated, free, independent in their thinking, concerned about improving and enhancing the world, and eager to participate in making life more meaningful and worthwhile for all. Do you feel like you've continued his legacy? We had different focus of interest, but he was a dedicated educator. A committed, uh, pretty much dewey educator, and that's uh, uh, something I've tried to follow in my own life. To what extent it succeeds, that's for other people to decide. Mm. Do you not think of those questions for yourself? 
do I think of them? Of a legacy, you mean? Yeah. That's not worth thinking about. I think of doing the best I can under current circumstances, and what the legacy will be, as I said, that's up to others to determine. We started this conversation, me asking you for context of our current life. Do you see the possibility of a radical shift where we address issues like inequality in education, the dysfunctional healthcare system, people unable to survive on minimum wage as a result of this crisis? Look, for every problem that we face from the huge existential ones like global warming, nuclear war, to the kind that you're discussing, which are very serious, for all of them, we know of solutions. The question is, will we find, will enough people, young people, people like you, find the ability, the commitment, the dedication to, uh, to implement the kinds of solutions that we know are possible, including for everything you just mentioned. You can't predict. There's no way to predict. It's a matter of will and choice. And for those topics, there's no predictions. It's a matter of action and not speculation. Walter Littman wrote, The public must be put in its place so that it may exercise its own powers, but no less and perhaps even more so that each of us may live free of the trampling and the roar of a bewildered herd. And that thinking ties into what I said earlier about James Madison uh, and even what Lewis Powell would say in his memorandum from 1971. It's people as spectators of actions, not participants. But let me ask you, after 91 years of life and after studying people through the annals of civilization, do you think we could become participants in this country? I think it's not only possible, but uh, there are very encouraging signs of it all around us. So let's take one example. Uh, take the case of the Green New Deal. Some form of Green New Deal is essential for survival. You go back a couple of years, it was either not talked about at all or it was just an object of ridicule. Now it's right on the legislative agenda. There may be something to be done about it. A lot will depend on the next election in November. But it's right in the center of attention. Now how did that happen? It wasn't a miracle. A group of young people, uh, Sunrise Movement, that took the lead from a large popular movement and began to take serious steps towards it leading to sitting in and congressional offices where they were supported by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, other young legislators who had come in in the wave of the activism that Bernie Sanders stimulated and inspired. Okay, they awakened some attention. Uh, by now, Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey from Massachusetts Senator joined in proposing legislation. It's now debated, can be improved, fixed, modified, and it can become the law of the land and offer us a path to the survival of humanity, to go back to the J.P. Morgan Chase memo. That's of significance and importance, and it tells us that popular action can do things. In fact, that memo from J.P. Morgan Chase uh, pointed out that the bank should put an end to its funding of fossil fuels. And one of the reasons they gave is that their reputation is at stake. Why is their reputation at stake? Because of activists who are pounding on the doors and saying, you can't get away with this. Okay. We can affect the behavior of the existing institutions and we can modify and change them. That, and it's, there are significant efforts to do that. Okay, that tells you 
the answer to your question is definitely yes. If people take up the cudgels and do the work. Your friend Howard Zinn once said that what matters is the countless small deeds of unknown people that lay the basis for the significant events that enter history. One of my favorite statements of his, I always quote it. He was a wonderful person. What do you make of that statement in this moment? It's absolutely correct. Can you tell me the names of the members of the Sunrise Movement who sat in, in Pelosi's office? Can you tell me the names of the young people who participated globally in the October global strike? And these are the people who changed the world. Those are the heroes of history. We don't know their names. So yes, uh, Zinn's comment was accurate, significant, and it's a kind of a guideline, a light that should shine in front of us as we follow the meaning and significance of that comment. Well, I'd like to say I'm certainly glad to know your name, and I thank you for all the work that you have done over the years and, and always for being so generous with your time. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you, Noam Chomsky. our show. Special thanks this week to the team at the Harvard Global Health Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If you'd like to learn more about Noam Chomsky and Dr. Ashish Jha, be sure to visit our site at www.talkeasypod.com. You can also listen to our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. If you'd like to be added to our email list, you can drop us a line at talkeasypod at gmail.com. To keep up with all that we're doing here on the show, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at talkeasypod. And as always, this show is made possible each week by our incredible team. Our executive producer is Janixa Bravo. Our associate producer is Nikki Spina. Illustrations by Krishna Shenoy. Graphics by Ian Jones. Music by Dylan Peck and Jin Sang. Our editors are Andre Lin and Kat Owen. Our engineer is Tim Moore. And finally, the show is produced by Caroline Reebok. I'm Sam Fragoso. Thank you for listening to Talk Easy. I'll see you back here next Sunday with W. Kamau Bell. Until then, have a safe week, everyone. Thank you.